recording here. Here we go. Part of that is these drop-in clinics that we're doing. Uh, we know obviously that everything is changing rapidly and, and there's a lot of people that are new to Blackboard. So this one is just to give you kind of a very brief overview introduction to Blackboard. If I talk too fast, I apologize. There's a lot of material to cover. Feel free to tell me to slow down. Absolutely feel free to post a message in the chat. If you have a question or if you have your mic, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me a question. Again, I'm here to help. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen. Give me one second here. There we go. And again, if anyone can just put a message in the chat, just let me know that you can hear me. Or, well, not hear me, but see my screen. Okay, so you should all be seeing what we call the main Blackboard homepage. Can everyone see this? Yes, perfect. Thank you, Jenny, for confirming. So this is, uh, we also call it maybe the My Institution page or the Blackboard homepage. It has a couple different names. But this is your opening page. This is your entrance to Blackboard. As you can see, uh, you have your course list over here. For whatever courses you're enrolled in, you would have a link over here. If you happen to be involved in an organization, kind of like a campus group, or maybe a department organization, that would appear here as well. Uh, there's a grouping for any institution announcements or any announcements from within your course organizations. Those would appear here. These are just some of the standard we call them modules that would appear on this page and it does differ by campus. So you might have, you know, a different layout or a slightly different color scheme. Things might be in a different place, but in general, you should at least have the course list or the My Courses module, the My Organizations and the My Announcements. These should pretty much be on every school's Blackboard page. If I'm gonna move my mouse up here in the corner, this is where your name would come up. As you can see right now, it's just displaying Open SUNY Help Desk, which is technically my name in the system. Uh, it is also an area where you can easily switch if you had multiple courses. I only happen to be in enrolled in one, so I only have one listed. But you can switch between classes, and there's other links on the left. Oh. Uh, if you can all just mute your mics, I seem to be getting some type of feedback. Um, but absolutely unmute yourself um, if you have a question. So again, we're just looking at the My Blackboard panel up here in the corner. These is going to list all of your all of your different uh, courses you're enrolled in, uh, the due dates, discussion posts. There's also an important area here for updates. You can see that's reflected in this little number up here. Updates are going to be any type of update, most likely either from Open SUNY from us. Or from your campus. So it could be a message about, uh, especially in these times, you know, the announcements are happening quickly. So a uh, system update most likely is what would appear in this area or if you post an announcement in one of your courses. As you can see, this is just some basic announcements related to a practice course that I have on the system. Another important link down here in this My Blackboard area, if I go down to the bottom, it says settings and then personal information. This area is where you can change your password, depending on different rules and regulations with your school. Uh, you can change your name. You can also personalize different things. You can set an avatar. A lot of students like to have a, a visual image of their professors. It helps them to identify with each other. All kinds of different things you can see in this area. And then also in this area is where you can edit your notification settings. So depending on what type of notifications you want to receive from the system, let me just go in here. You can say, I want to get an email every time somebody submits something, anytime uh, something is overdue or a student asks a question in a discussion or post a new blog post. You'd want to look through here and see what type of notifications you want to get. I would, I mean, it's a very handy tool, but just be careful about what ones you do enable in here because it can make your inbox fill up very quickly. But it is very handy and this, these are just some of the different notifications that you can get. And then you do have your choice if you want to get the dashboard uh, notifications. That's like that updates panel that we were just looking at. You can also choose to get certain notifications via email. And then some schools also let you receive a mobile notification, which would be a notification like on your cell phone, like a text message. So now that we've looked at the notifications, I'm going to go back to the main Blackboard page and I'm going to go into a course. So this is just a practice course that we have set up. And I'm just going to walk you through a very general overview of the different types of items 
that you can create in this class. And again, please feel free to ask me a question in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask me a question uh, and tell me to slow down if I go too fast. So the first thing we're going to do is this is the, now compared to the Blackboard homepage, this is the course homepage. And this is where you might have different announcements or, you know, needs attention type things, alerts related to this specific class. You will typically have one of these homepages in each class and it would be customized so you'd only be getting alerts for this specific course. So if you're in English 101, for example, you would only get alerts about that one versus if you teach English 102, you would only get alerts about that class. And you do have the ability to customize this page. There's different, again, we call them modules that you can add. There's different colors if you wanna change the color scheme. I also like to experiment with this little rainbow icon up here in the corner and change the color scheme. It just helps to customize the class a little bit more. We'll go over these other buttons up here in the corner in a minute. But for now, I'm gonna to go to the course materials area. And like I said, we're just gonna discuss the different kinds of items and activities that you can create in Blackboard. What you're gonna do is once you go in here, and again, it might not be called course materials for you. Some schools call it something different. It could be called lessons, content, learning modules. Those are just a few of the typical names that this could be called. Uh, Karen Q asks, where are the notification settings again? Karen, you wanna go up to the top corner of Blackboard and click on your name, and then it would be under there. You go to settings, your name, settings, and the edit notification settings. Then you have your choice to customize the notifications per class or all, you know, in bulk. So if you have four different classes and you decide I wanna get an email or a dashboard notification you know, in all four classes, that would be the other option up there. Great question. So if I go back to the, the main course here, um, Karen, if you can't find it under your name and then under settings, try looking at the home page in your class. See if you have one of these like uh, what's new or needs attention modules. And you can also find the button in there. It's another way to, to get to the same area. So I'm gonna go back to course materials because that's where you're really gonna build and add the most items to your class, all of your content. Uh, some of the standard items that you might create would be uh, an item, a file, a web link, a content folder, and a blank page. And I'm gonna go over all those, but again, this is just a very overarching view and introduction to all these different items. Uh, the first option is an item. I go to build content item. So I put in a name and then I can give it some text, uh, which would be like directions or an information, something about that, something about this item. And then below this, I can attach a file. So I'm going to uh, say uh, chapter one. We'll just pretend that this is something that we want the students to read. Read chapter one. go and then I'm going to upload a PDF file. There we go. So again I think I just mentioned you know we do like to keep whatever text you add here maybe to about three or four paragraphs just because it can clutter up the view. But this is a great way to give students a file that you want them to view and they give a little notice about that file. Whenever possible, we do recommend using a PDF file if you have that option. I mean, you can also do a Word document or a PowerPoint file or really any kind of file. But a PDF file, if a student clicks on it, you can see all they have to do is click on it and then it's gonna open up and it's gonna view it right within the browser, right like this. Versus if it was a Word document, then the student would have to click on it and then they would have to actually download it. And I'll just give you an example of a Word document just so you can see visually different. I mean, both are completely acceptable. This is just trying to streamline the process as much as possible for your students. So Word document, if I click on it, then I have to download it, and then I would have to open it in Word. So just the difference, a PDF file is very nice and streamlined, but again, it really will accept any type of file. So the second item that we're gonna look at and maybe I should stop using the word item. But under the build content menu, 
The next thing we're going to look at is file. Um, the only, the, it's very similar to a item, but you don't have the option to type in any directions. Sometimes it isn't necessary to give them that additional information. Sometimes it is. So again, I'm just going to upload a file just so you can see the difference. Here we go. So you can see there's no little text, but still, if I click on it, then it opens right within the same page. So an item and a file are very similar. The only difference is that an item lets you give a little bit more instructions or directions, a little bit more text about the file you have attached. Those are the two most common ways that you're going to upload something or attach something within the course. One thing I should have looked at that I didn't is that when you do create any type of item on Blackboard, you have this ability down here to select date and time restrictions. So you can say like, for example, maybe I don't want my students to see this today. Maybe I don't want them to see it until starting next week. And then I only want them to be able to see it for a few days. So I can say available from the 23rd to the 27th. And then this way, it's still gonna appear for me as the instructor, but I can see again, as the instructor, I can see this little message that says item is hidden from students. So if we note that this is chapter one, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll up here to the top and I'm gonna use this button that says enter student preview. The student preview button is a great way when you do add anything to your class, especially if you have a date and time restriction, that you can view the class as a student to make sure that it isn't appearing. So that items that should be appearing do, but items that don't appear, don't. So as you can see, as a student, I don't see chapter one, which I shouldn't because I had said that it wasn't available until next week. And that's with pretty much anything you create in Blackboard, whether it's an assignment, a test, a discussion, or uploading a file or creating an assignment, you should always have that option to set up future date and time restrictions. It isn't necessary, but it's a great function, especially if you're going to be building ahead, if you're going to adding, be adding like maybe multiple weeks of materials on the Blackboard. Uh, I know we all don't really know when the COVID-19 issue is going to resolve itself, so some people might end up doing that, having more than one week of materials, you know, on your course. Uh, so the next slide that we're going to look at is we're going to say we're going to build a web link. Web links are nice if you want to point them to an outside resource. Like in this case, I'm going to point them to, we'll say, the New York Times website. And I hope I have the right address here. I think that's correct. So you just have to give it the name. Again, you have to give it a title, the URL. You have, just like when you're building an item, you have the option to give text, a little bit of information if you'd like, or attach a file, select date and time restrictions. And like I said, you'll see these options on, on pretty much everything you create in Blackboard. So this is a web link. And if I click on it, it should bring me to the New York Times website. So just like that. So that was build content web link. And that's like I said, that's a great tool if you need to direct them, you know, to look at a third party or an outside website, something outside of Blackboard that you want to reference. Web link. The next one that we're going to create is a content folder. And that again is under the build content button. You're going to use that build content button a lot. Build content, content folder. A content folder is, is similar to a filing cabinet folder, like that old vanilla folder that we're all used to, where you can put different items in the folder. It's a great way to organize your materials. Um, you have two choices, typically. Many people organize their course content maybe on a weekly basis or by assignment, by, by type. So you might put all of your assignments in one folder, all of your discussions in another folder, all of your tests in another folder, like I said. So either weekly, you know, something like that, or by type. In this case, I'm gonna do week one. And whenever I create anything new, it automatically goes to the bottom of my screen down here. And then I have the ability, if I want to, I can click into week one and I can build new items just like we were doing before. I can also, if I've already created something and I want to move it into that folder, I can click this little down arrow, we call it a chevron icon, and I get a menu with different items, different options. I can say move, and I can move it 
into week one. So if I had already had something created, I can move it into week one, or I can click on week one and then I can add new materials as well. Uh, so that was a content folder. And again, it looks like the little yellow manila folder that we're all used to. The next item that I want to talk about is a blank page. So I'm actually going to go into week one to build this. Build content blank page. A blank page is text from you to your students. So this isn't like a, like a Word document or a file or a PowerPoint presentation. This is maybe something like your, your lectures that you'd normally stand in front of the class, um, you know, that you would want to copy paste and give to them. Or uh, maybe like a brief overview, like um, this is a list of, oops, I can't type very well, one materials. So I could do a bulleted list and say, read chapter one, discuss questions at the end, complete the assignment. So this is again, just an example of another of a blank page. It's similar to a Word document where you have all kinds of different options of what you want to type on the page. And if I click on it, this is what I see. You can see my bulleted list that I created. It does appear a little bit differently for students. They don't get the option to edit or any of these toolbar options up the top. So I'm going to click on the student preview button just like we did before. And I'll give you an idea, just a visual of how it looks for students. So course materials, and then we put it in the week one folder, and then week one materials. So as you can see, they don't have those options up at the top that we were seeing before, that toolbar. And students obviously don't see the build content menu up here either. That is just an instructor area so that you can help build your course. And then exit preview to come back into instructor mode course materials. There we go. So that was a blank page versus a, a Word document or something. Um, another thing is if you ever wanted to rearrange these items or rearrange these items over here, you have two ways to rearrange the list. If you can see my mouse as I move it into the yellow, or into the, I'm sorry, into the left margin, I can click and drag and move things around just like I can on the menu over here. I wanted to move discussions up. I also have these arrows here and here. And these arrows can also help me rearrange the items in the class. So versus this little down arrow would let you move things to a different folder or you could copy it if you wanted to make a you know, another copy of a, an item. But that lets you to move and rearrange, reorder the content in the class. Does anybody have any questions? I feel like I'm going very fast. <laughs> feel free to speak up if you have a microphone. Um, you would just need to unmute yourself or um, put a message in the chat. Uh, so I will keep looking in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that. So we talked, I just covered a very little bit. This is called the course menu over here. Now there are two, it's kind of hard to see here with the color scheme I have. Let me go back to the default color scheme. That doesn't really help. But there are two different sections to the course menu. This section up here is what your students can see. And then down here at the bottom is course management on the control panel. Students can't see any of the links down here. These are all just further tools that you're going to use to help develop and manage the class. Kind of, you know, once you've built everything, uh, there's different sections in here if you want to create an announcement. Um, a discussion board, a test. There's going to be other uh, trainings I know to go over those specific tools. But again, students can only see what's up here. And then just to give you an idea, the couple of the things you might use, we went over the build content area a lot. Assessments is another button that you're going to use quite frequently, most often, probably to create an assignment. You might also call it a Dropbox. That's just a word that terminology Blackboard uses. They call it an assignment. We can say like chapter one homework. And just like with many of the other things that we've created, we have a box where we can give instructions. You can attach a file. 
Now with an assignment, this is kind of new, but we have a due date feature. So I could say that this is due, we'll say Friday by the end of the day. Now one thing you can see is I'm putting in 11.59 p.m. This is just a little thing that we've learned, especially at the help desk. If you ever have something that's due at midnight, don't use 12 a.m. or 12.00 exactly. Uh, a lot of people think that midnight ends the day, but midnight actually starts the day. And that causes a lot of confusion among students. So we recommend that you just skew it just by a minute or two, or even say 11.30 at night or 12.30 in the morning, just instead of using that 12.00 exactly. It helps eliminate some confusion. The nice thing too is if you program in a due date, it automatically adds a date to the calendar that students use in Blackboard. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, points possible, we do have to give it a points possible. And we'll say in this case, maybe it's worth 100 points. If you have a rubric, you can add it here. Uh, that is something that we could help you with. It does have to be in a special Blackboard format. But if you already have a rubric, maybe you have one written in Word that you use quite a bit. We could help you with putting that on Blackboard. Some of the different options when creating an assignment. Uh, the two most popular ones I see are individual submission. This means that each student submits their own assignment, their own homework. Group submission, if you created groups, maybe you call them teams in your class, you can say that this is a team assignment. So all of the teams, all of the groups would have to submit it. With a group assignment, the difference is that you might have a group of say five people, five students, but only one of them would submit the assignment. That's the difference between individual. Individual submission, every student, like all 20 students in the class, submit their own. Group submission, one person in the group submits it for everybody. And then typically when you grade it, you would give everybody the same grade. So everybody in the group would receive the same grade. Just another option. Number of attempts, if you just give them one attempt, per person, single attempt, otherwise you have the option to give them three or four or however many attempts they get. If you do give them multiple attempts, you can set up the grade book for which attempt you want to grade. If you want to say, I give them three, but the final grade would be an average of all three or the highest of all three. I don't think you probably you choose lowest. That wouldn't really be very nice um, or last graded. Again, just some different options if you give multiple attempts. If you don't give multiple attempts, then obviously, as you can see, that doesn't appear. So for now, I'm gonna say they get three attempts. Plagiarism tools. There's two most popular plagiarism tools within Blackboard. This one is called SafeAssign. This, what, what SafeAssign and the other one is called Turnitin. Depends on your school and, and what type of licensing they have, but these are the two most common, SafeAssign and Plagiarism and turn it in. What happens is that when a student submits a paper, it automatically gets checked against the database and then you get a report. So before we even grade it, you will get a report from SafeAssign or like I said from turn it in saying, uh, I don't know, 20% of this paper, of the text in this paper was found somewhere else. And then it would tell you it was found on this website or something similar to that. So when you're grading, before you really grade, you'll be able to look at that report and see how much of it was potentially plagiarized. The other option down here, if I check this, is if I want students to be able to see the plagiarism report as well. Some people do, some people don't, that's just a preference. Grading options. I don't see grading options used too much. Um, some people do like to use anonymous grading what that means is that while you're viewing all of your student submissions, so we'll say again, maybe you have 20 students in your class and you're going through one by one, that you don't wanna see their names, that you just wanna grade it based on the content without seeing the student names. Not a common practice, but you never know. Again, just a preference. A lot of these are just different preferences. There's a lot of different options available and it's really just gonna be about you finding out what works best for you and what works easiest for you. Enable delegated grading, that typically is used if you have a teaching assistant. So at some of the larger colleges, or maybe even on a graduate level or something, we see that, but again, not frequently used. Display of grades, this is how you want the students to be able to visually see their scores. 
if you want them to see it as just a number, a letter, a percentage. Uh, complete and incomplete is nice if it's an assignment that doesn't count. So maybe like an icebreaker or something where they just have to do it. You know, it doesn't have any point value. They just have to complete it and submit it. That's a situation where you would use complete and incomplete. Make the assignment available. This has to be set to yes. You do have the option, like we've discussed all along, about setting different start and end dates in the future. So I could say, just like we've done before, this doesn't start until next week. Just get in and do this here. There we go. So I can say this doesn't start until next week, but this still needs to be checked. It does mean, though, that students won't be able to get into it. They won't even be able to see it until this time, but this does have to have a check mark. Track number of views, it doesn't hurt to have that enabled, uh, especially when it comes to running different um, activity reports and looking at the activity logs in the class, that can help. If you forget and you don't check it off, it's fine. It doesn't impact the assignment or the grade at all, but it's a good tool to have selected, like I said, just in case you ever need to run an activity log. So I'm going to click Submit on this, and then go to the bottom, Chapter 1 Homework. So even though this is hidden from students, we still have the ability to see it. And I'm just going to click on it to give you a visual of what students would see. Oh, I made it a group assignment. That was my fault. Hang on one second. So if, like me, you make an error and you need to change something, especially change the settings, click this little down arrow. And before we said move, I'm going to say delete or edit. I'm just going to edit the settings because I don't want it to be a group assignment. Not in this case. So I'm going to click on chapter one homework. And now, right now, this would be, you'll see a message up here, preview upload assignment. That just lets me know that I'm in it as an instructor. Students won't see that. It would just say assignment chapter one homework. It tells them the due date, how many points it's worth. Uh, up here, if I added any additional directions or instructions, it would appear up here as well. And they also get the message that it's being checked for plagiarism. Students have a couple different choices. They can click on write submission. Maybe they want to copy paste something from Microsoft Word. Or if it's just a quick and short assignment, they can type directly in this box. Most of them will probably do a file attachment. Browse my computer, select the file. That is most typically how students will submit it. And then they could add comments if they had a question about something. I'm going to click Submit. Yeah, it doesn't let me save because I'm in as a professor. But when a student does submit something, it's going to cut. You're going to go to this course menu over here, and we're going to go to Grade Center, Needs Grading. Any activity that they submit will be, will be summarized in this area. I don't happen to have any things right now that need to be graded, but you can see there are some drop down lists up here. So assuming I had more than one item, this is where I would be able to, you know, filter the page um, just to see all different items. But in general, you would have the student's name and then whatever the name of the assignment is, you could click on it and then you could grade it and also view that plagiarism report that we talked about. I'm going to go back to course materials. Uh, there's a future session on Grade Center coming up. I think it's next week, uh, and that one goes a little bit more in depth. You know, this one, this this training is really this session is just a very introductory level, um, you know, introduction to Blackboard. So I know I'm hitting a lot. Uh, Karen asked, "Does the grading of the exam or assignment have to occur in Blackboard? Do you just enter the grades?" Karen, so if you create an assignment or an exam in Blackboard it automatically adds a column in the full grade center. This is like, like you would see maybe an Excel spreadsheet. I'm just going to scroll across so you can see that. So you can see, because I've created a few different things over here. So if you create the assignment, if they submit it on Blackboard, then it automatically comes into needs grading. You would grade it, and then it would move to full grade center. Now, especially because this is kind of mid-semester and a lot of people are you know, not have been teaching online this whole time, you've been teaching face to face. If you wanted to, or I should say, if you want to, if you have grades that you wanted to enter into here for stuff they've already submitted, you could hit create column. 
And then I could say, okay, well, you know, I think I've been using chapter two, so I'll say chapter one. And maybe this is something that students have submitted in class, you know, uh, throughout the semester. But this lets me manually create a column in the grade book. And then it goes to the far right. And then I could type in, you know, so-and-so got 90 or 95, something like that. So again, I know this is just a very quick kind of look, but uh, so just to summarize that, if it's something they have submitted on Blackboard, it comes into needs grading, you grade it, and then it moves to full grade center. And then if it's not something they have submitted on Blackboard, you have the ability to go into the grade center and manually create an entry and then manually enter grades, enter scores for it. And one of, one of the thing I just did want to show you because there was a question about exams. A lot of people ask, a lot of people have students who maybe need an accommodation, uh, like maybe they get time and a half. So this is a test that I've already created. And again, I know there's another session, I'm not quite sure when it is about tests a little further in depth, but I have the ability to click this little Chevron icon, this little down arrow and say, edit the test options. This is very common. A lot of people have students that get an accommodation of some kind. And this is where I can do it. So it starts off test options up the top. I have the name, the description. Uh, and just like the assignment, make available to students has to be set to yes. I have the ability to add a new announcement. Uh, the nice thing is that if you say yes, but the test hasn't started yet, it won't send the announcement yet. Just like the assignment, I could give them multiple attempts. Force completion is not a setting that we recommend. It sounds like a good idea that it must be completed in one sitting, but it really causes a lot of problem behind the scenes because a lot of students are using Wi-Fi connections and they get timed out and then the test submits and then you got to reset it for them. So from a help desk perspective, just don't do it. <laughs> Set timer, obviously a very common uh, thing with a test, most tests are timed. In this case, I've said that this test is 30 minutes now, 30 minutes here, but I can go down and I can say that I have a student, let's say this student here gets time and a half, or yeah, time and a half, so that would be, I can't do math, 45 minutes. This student gets extra time. I could also use this if the rest, so if I could say that the rest of the class only has uh, from the 19th, to the 20th to do this, but John has from the 21st to the 23rd. So again, just a little way, Blackboard has an automatic ability built in that you can create a test availability exception to give accommodations or special requirements to one student or, or multiple students. The same can be said if you have a group, like if you have an entire group, like maybe five students, that need extra time, you can add a group here as well. Just like the assignment, you can add in a due date. Uh, we do recommend uh, this option here, do not allow students to start if the test has, if the due date is passed. If you don't check this box, students can still submit the test even though the due date has expired, but it would just be marked late. And then different items down here, you definitely wanna say include in the test center score calculations. This is the type of feedback that you want students to be able to see once they get done. Most typically, I see people say after the due date. Again, so that way students won't be able to review their submissions until after the due date has passed. Ah, so, or uh, after the end date. Let me get back here, end date. But that's pretty standard, that you don't want them to be able to see anything until it's done. There we go. So I think uh, the last thing that I will, oops, let me close out of all that. The last thing that I'll quickly go over is discussions. You can see that I created this discussion here. So students would just click on this. You have given them, you know, in this case, this is just an icebreaker discussion, but students would come in and click on the link and then they click on create thread and then they would post their message. And then in here, I'm just gonna put some, not very exciting.
there we go. So then their posts would come up in here. Now, this is gonna be, you know, student A. Student B comes in and they can either create thread, respond to the original topic, or they can click on the first post and reply. I'm just gonna say replying just so you can get a visual about how it all looks. If I go back to the discussion. So it doesn't appear here at the reply, but I have to click on the thread and then it's kind of embedded underneath it. So two different actions within discussions. Students can create a thread and reply to the original topic or they can reply to an existing student post. So I think I Went over everything on my list. Um, we're going to just expect to use the build content menu quite a bit for adding new materials. And then really any assessment tool that you want to create as far as a test or assignment, that's going to be under this area here. We are right at 538, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know I just hit you with a lot of information. So I'm going to put the help desk phone number one more time because we are here to answer any questions you have. And please feel free to give that phone number to your students as well. I know a lot we didn't touch on, like we didn't go over like live sessions like Zoom or Collaborate. Um, there's all kinds of different things in Blackboard that isn't really covered in this introductory session. So, but if you have any questions, we are here to help. If anything seems to go wrong or not calculate um, properly, like in the gradebook, we are here for everything, students and faculty. Karen asks, what are the hours? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, so let me just write this so Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to midnight. And then Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And Sunday, 1 to 9 p.m. So I just put all that in the chat. And the phone number is 1-844-OPEN-SUNY. Just to let you know, our offices are, are temporarily closed with what's going on. So we haven't been answering the phone live. We're looking on doing that soon, getting remote access, but right now all of us are working from home. So if we don't pick up the phones when you call, please leave a message and we are responding, responding to voicemail. We also have a live chat available. I will give you that link. It's on our main website. If you go to that website, it's gonna come up in the little bottom corner with a live chat. You can talk to any of us live if we're available during those times. Uh, that website also lets you submit an email or a web request. And again, please give that phone number to your students too, because you are going to have so much going on yourself. Don't worry about trying to troubleshoot their technical problems and just leave that to us because we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Is there anything else? I think we're right at 540. Anything you want to hit me with? Okay. Well, I appreciate you all signing on. I know there's some more sessions coming up. I'm doing one on Gradebook next week. And... Um, there's more, there's tests, there's uh, assignments, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So look for the, the website you were signed up for this one, because I know there's more. But if you have any questions in the meantime, call us at the help desk and we're here to help, okay? Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for coming, bye.